Witness after witness, all the way up to the 13th century, visited the Dome of the Rock and described it in detail. Yet, not a single mention of any inscriptions inside the dome, at least related to the Quran. What does this mean to our Muslim friends and their claim about the inscriptions inside the Dome of the Rock? Today we're going to talk about uh, basically, uh, you know, additional evidence concerning that. And of course, with us here to unpack all of this for us is no other than Mel himself, who is joining me remotely. Uh, Mel, welcome back. And uh, thank you so much, of course, as always, for taking time to do so. Well, it's great to see you, Al Fadi. Um, so today we're going to be looking at when we first see the correct inscriptions. We're going to find evidence that there were other inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock, which were done by the Crusaders. Um, so if we look to this, um, just in the preview of what happened, uh, the Persian Nasir visited the site in 1047 AD, and he identifies the dedication of al Mamun on one of these gates, but not in the Dome of the Rock. From the interior, he merely mentions the unique woodwork for the ceiling and roofing. He also provides for a detailed account of removable interior decorations and the supernatural rock itself. He is silent about the mosaics and the inscriptions. And the big question that A.J. Juice would, would ask is, why would he not mention these? Well, the simple explanation might be that there was a major earthquake in 1033. This is just 14 years afterwards. And he's not mentioning the mosaics. He's commenting about the woodwork on the ceiling. Now, from any of the pictures I've seen of the interior of the Dome of the Rock, the last thing I would mention would be the woodwork of the ceiling. It would be the, the artwork, the mosaics and so forth, but he was seeing something else. So this strikes against the idea that there were inscriptions there at that time. Then we have 1322, another witness who, who describes dramatically different dimensions from the current Dome of the Rock. John Mandeville had supposedly been in Jerusalem around 1322. He said that it was twice as high as wide, the dominant exterior feature being marble pillars all round. But it should be noted that the Dome of the Rock today is not twice as high as it is wide, but about three quarters high as it is wide, which should indicate to all of us that really dramatic changes were done to the Dome of the Rock over the centuries. Now, we also have the Andalusian jurist Ibn al-Arabi, who visited the Dome of the Rock around 1092 to 1095, but leaves no description of Abdul al-Malik's mosaics or inscriptions. The Russian abbot Daniel visited the Holy Land in 1106 and left detailed descriptions that include the first mention of interior mosaics, but does not mention the all-important inscriptions. And then we have... Benjamin of Tudela, who visits the Temple Mount around 1171 AD, and here's what he has to say. Jerusalem has four gates, the Gate of Abraham, the Gate of David, the Gate of Zion, and the Gate of Gushpat, which is the Gate of Shabbat, facing our ancient temple now called Templum Domini. Upon the site of the sanctuary, Omar bin al-Khattab erected an edifice with a very large and magnificent cupola. So the, the point that A.J. Juice would make is, why did he claim that Omar or Umar built this edifice if there was an inscription inside? The inscription should have made him aware that Abdul al-Malik or al-Mamun built the Dome of the Rock, and yet, having visited the site, he went away thinking it was Umar. So that indicates that the inscription wasn't there. We also have Ali of Harat, 1187, who mentions Quranic verses over the entrances, but crucially not any inside on the arcades. And we also have Ibn Battuta, 1355, who mentions interior ornaments, but no dedicatory inscriptions. So these are a lot of witnesses that went to the Dome of the Rock, and it's very telling that they don't mention the key inscriptions. We also have this here. It's a coin from... Uh, the, the um, sorry, I'm going blank. We got a coin here from the Crusader period, coin from Al Amal Rick I, which is thought to show the city of Jerusalem. Now, where you see the arrow, 
that is the Dome of the Rock at that time. And you will notice that it doesn't look very much like the Dome of the Rock today. The roof is very different. It's not a dome. It's more like, well, I suppose an acorn or something like that. And it has got a, a huge crescent moon on the top. We have another example here, and it's the coin on the far, uh, the image on the far right of the coin. And it looks much more like an acorn than the current dome. And you can see more clearly there the crescent moon on the top. Um, the the design of these seals is not detailed enough to provide for clues other than the apparent cone shape of the cupola that rests on a tower-like main building that appears to be crowned by a ring of arcades. A priest, Johann von Würzburg in Germany, confirms the above decorations in the 1160s. He also delivers a detailed observation of the exterior and interior of the Dome of the Rock. He describes four doors with beautiful entrances. But the key thing he doesn't mention is there, there's no mention of the inscriptions. Now, what Johann does mention is inscriptions which are very different to the inscriptions we have today, and these are probably put there by the Crusaders. So under the roof outside to the west, it says, Eternal peace be to this house from the Eternal Father. Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his holy place. The house of the Lord is well founded upon the firm rock, and so forth. Truly the Lord is in that place, and I knew it not. And lastly, the temple of the Lord is holy. It is God's culture, it is God's building. Um, this doesn't sound very Islamic. It's uh, a crusader inscription. And we also have another person, Theodericus, the 1170s. He mentions additional inscriptions. And these are over the arc of the choir. So these would be interior ones. And I'll just mention one or two of them just to give you a flavor. But they're very definitely Christian. My house is called the house of prayer, says the Lord. In it, whoever asks, receives. Whoever asks, finds. And it will be open to him who knocks. This is straight out of the Gospels. Ask and be affectionate, seek and find. Okay, so this is contrary evidence to the inscriptions being early. We have mention of inscriptions, but these are different inscriptions to what we have today. Um, and then we have Ibn Taymiyyah in the 14th century who is a very key person in the creation of the Sen. He says it was Abdul al-Malik who built a dome over the rock during his reign, during the civil war that broke out between him and Ibn Azubair. Um, A.J. Deuce comments, it is posting that Ibn Taymiyyah is so sure about the builder, given that an alleged interior inscription would say otherwise, i.e. al-Mamun. He does not say the dome, but a dome. Does he perhaps know that the Dome of the Rock, as it stands before him, is not the one that had originally been built? And then finally, the, the roof of the dome is destroyed once more, this time by fire in 1448. Would our inscriptions that no one mentions survive? So, um, so the, the roof gets burnt down. And if you look at the picture there, you can see that the roof is directly above the archways. The mosaics are very close to the roof. Now, if you can imagine what would happen if a roof uh, catches on fire, the, the beams would have been twisted and warped with the heat before eventually falling down. That warping would have pushed, pushed against the arcades and would certainly have done physical damage to the arcade, probably fire damage as well. You'd expect that tiles would have come off. And yet, if we look at the Dome of the Rock today, particularly the mosaics and the inscriptions, you would never believe that there was ever a fire inside. It doesn't look like there has been any damage to the uh, inscriptions. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Alfadi. Uh, I mean, again, these are really compelling arguments. Indeed, um, you know, what uh, caught my attention here, if there were such inscriptions, then those who re recorded uh, the other inscriptions, why did they at least overlook mentioning something about Quranic inscriptions? Um, I mean, apparently they did not see it or they did not notice it, uh, at least. Uh, but uh, if it was there, where was it? Was it hidden behind something? Uh, but it's, it's what a coincidence that a number of those people didn't even, like, like Ibn Battuta, for instance, why would an Ibn Battuta doesn't mention something important like this? Yeah, it's it's... It's very hard to find a convincing reason. I think the easiest explanation is simply they weren't there yet. Right. Um, 
we, all we have is we have the suggestion that they've always existed there. But what we should be seeing consistent with that is at least a number of regular mentions of them. There should have been um, reactions to these inscriptions. So Christians should have been responding to what this claim is inside the Dome of the Rock. And we see none of that. We don't see any Muslims boasting about these inscriptions or supporting them. Um, and these are all things we would expect. Now, an argument that could be made is, oh, well, the Crusaders couldn't speak Arabic. This is uh, an argument I've heard a number of times. The thing is, in order for that argument to hold, you have to believe that there were no Arab Christians in Israel. There were no Arab Christians ever visiting Jerusalem, none. And those that did never mentioned anything about the inscriptions. I find that hard to believe. I think if an Arab Christian went inside the Dome of the Rock, the first thing they would have done is written down what it said and informed the Crusaders and probably suggested that they take it down as an affront to Christianity because it's one interpretation you can make is that it's an attack on Christianity itself. So why would the Crusaders not destroy that if it's there? Um, I don't buy the argument that the Crusaders would have simply been happy to paint over it or something like that and just leave it be. I think they would have taken um, actions to destroy it, particularly when there was um, a letter from the Pope that basically said that he considered the, the name of Muhammad blasphemous and it shouldn't be memorialized. So I think that's enough of an encouragement for any Christian to destroy the thing. So I, I think, as far as I can see it, I think AJ Juice has got a very strong case. Um, now, as I say, in part one, I, I mentioned the fact that this is all provisional. Um, I haven't seen any contrary evidence. Um, Thomas Alexander will be producing videos with contrary evidence, and it'll be interesting to see what he's found um, outside of AJ Juice's paper to see if it holds up or whether it's um, exaggerated or, or whatever it might be. But as far as I can see at this stage, it looks like it's strong evidence. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this. And uh, we will continue with this series next time. Until then, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.